Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, with our ongoing series on inequality and difference today, in the first half we are going to discuss on tribal resistance movement, whereas in the second half we are going to talk on tribal independence. Uh, post-independence tribal legislation and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Dr. Shruti Vip. Dr. Shruti Vip is Assistant Professor in Department of History, PGDAV Evening College, University of Delhi. Dr. Vip's immense experience and uh, her keen interest in giving her knowledge to the students will definitely help you in understanding today's two topic in detail. Now I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Shruti Vip and uh, would request her to continue further. Hello ma'am, welcome to the lecture. Hello Geetika. Uh, it's my pleasure to be on this platform uh, and uh, I welcome all of you uh, in this ongoing discussion on the tribal situation in India. Uh, this is a very important topic as far as the series inequality and difference is concerned because uh, uh, tribal groups can be considered as one of the most marginalized groups in India uh, and the way uh, they have been treated in the past and the discrimination is still carrying on uh, needs a careful uh, discussion and also uh, an in-depth analysis of the whole situation. So carrying forward our discussion. Uh, in today's lecture, I would be, be briefly talking about as to uh, how a tribe can be distinguished from a, a, a non-tribal uh, individual, how tribals can be considered as belonging to a unique category and then also we would be talking in detail uh, about the tribal resistance movement especially during the colonial period uh, and then of course this would uh, uh, be uh, there would also be a reference to post colonial developments and how tribal resistance movements did not end uh, uh, once India got independence rather it was an ongoing process because their rights uh, were not really taken care of adequately uh, even after independence and they did uh, feel discriminated uh, and uh, so therefore wherever, whenever there was a question of their rights they had to take up arms even if uh, it was against their own uh, government. So now coming back to the issue as to who is a, an Adivasi which is a term that has been used time and again to describe uh, a tribal. So the term Adivasi connotes uh, that uh, these were the group of people who were probably the original inhabitants. Adi means the old, uh, Vasi means the inhabitant. So they were probably the oldest inhabitants of the land and uh, uh, this was their original habitat and they were native to the soil. So therefore uh, they were not uh, someone who had migrated from anywhere. Uh, or abroad rather they were the true sons of the soil and this is how they have been described time and again. Then another important sociological uh, description uh, that has been offered time and again by scholars is that they speak a common dialect, they share certain cultural virtues, they act together for common purposes, they believe in community life and there is uh, an absence of individualistic way of thinking and leading life. Also they live in a, uh, a tribe lives in a definite habitat and an area uh, and they uh, remain unified by social organization, by marriage ties, kinship ties and uh, blood relationships play a very important role in this uh, overall uh, communal uh, way of uh, 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 livelihood that they follow and also uh, a cultural homogeneity is another very important uh, feature that distinguishes the tribes uh, and they uh, of course they have common uh, scheme of deities uh, their uh, worshipping uh, together is again a very important feature of their uh, social life and they have common ancestors uh, as well as uh, common folklore to fall back on. So these are some of the important features which from a sociological perspective uh, are very important to di distinguish a tribe uh, from rest of the population. Uh, then also their habitat and their culture not only provides them with a sense of identity uh, uh, and also a sense of freedom, a sense of belongingness but also 
it empowers them, uh, it grants them a certain respect, uh, it makes them unique and also it uh, helps them in standing unitedly against their exploitation in mobilization. It plays a very important role uh, in uh, you know uh, projecting a group activity in which they are indulging time and again. And this also helped them in mobilizing against their oppressors, for example, against the Zamidars, Thikadars, against the British officials during the colonial period and then after independence uh, against the repressive state machinery as well as against the capitalists, against the global monsters, etc. So, therefore, uh, now uh, we turn to the tribal history of India uh, in, in which I would be uh, basically talking about a number of revolts that uh, were organized by the tribes themselves uh, against their oppressors and how uh, their struggle is abundant with stories of courage, with stories of self-sacrifice as well as uh, uh, whenever the occasion arose, they were always uh, upright against their exploiters. Uh, so, therefore, uh, uh, right from the very beginning, it is important to understand as to what were the causes uh, that instigated them to rebel time and again. And uh, one can talk about uh, talk of almost 70 to 80 uh, tribal rebellions uh, from uh, somewhere like 1770s onwards. So, from 1770s till date, there have been a series of tribal rebellions. So, what were the most important causes that one can talk of. So, definitely one important cause that I had discussed in the last lecture also is the issue of resources as to who controls the resources which rightfully belong to the tribals who were the original inhabitants of the areas and also uh, the issue of control over land and forests. So, once forest legislations became need of the hour from 1860s onwards, there was uh, no looking back for the tribals and they had no option but to mobilize themselves and ask for their rights because these uh, forests were the, the one of the most important resource for them uh, and uh, in fact, in the kind of subsistence economy in which they were uh, they were they had been surviving for so many centuries now that very existence was in question so therefore uh, these two important issues that is the question of resources and the question of land and forests have been important uh, uh, and leading factors behind most of the tribal movements and then this uh, generally was followed by uh, some other demands like uh, you know the the political demands and the demands for uh, social e uh, equality etc now, a very important scholar who has done great uh, detailed research work uh, uh, on tribes is Xasa uh, and Xasa writing in 2012 uh, pointed out that the erosion on land rights of tribes began with the coming of the British rule and administration. So, it was not as if it is after globalization or after industrialization uh, since 1947 onwards that the tribal rights were being trampled upon uh, because uh, the Britishers they wanted to expand their forte, they wanted to uh, you know uh, uh, have connections between the periphery and the core. And therefore, uh, it was but natural that the tribal areas would also come uh, uh, within the ambit of this uh, program that the Britishers had on their mind. So, therefore, uh, uh, right from the establishment of the colonial rule, that is from 1757 onwards, with when English East India Company uh, uh, was able to uh, control a larger area, especially after uh, 1764 Battle of Buxar that uh, those uh, areas which were under the control of tribes started uh, coming uh, within the uh, you know uh, network of the colonial uh, uh, masters and they wanted to gain control over these areas and the, the trend started from 1770s, 1780s onwards. So, therefore, there was a combination of 
forces uh, that were at work during the colonial period and the most important uh, factor that was uh, working during this entire uh, you know almost 200 uh, O old period was that the introduction of private property in land and this tendency had started much earlier with the introduction of the permanent uh, land revenue system and by the end of 19th century uh, uh, this process of creating a private property in land had taken big lead and therefore with this started the penetration of the market forces. So, it was not as as if prior to Britishers there was uh, no uh, intrusion in the tribal areas or there was no interference by the uh, uh, Rajas or the chiefs or the rulers in the tribal areas. But what was different now was the scale and the extent of exploitation and the influx of the market forces which happened in a big way uh, post uh, you know 19th century. Uh, then another related uh, issue was the problem of land alienation. Now, this problem in contemporary times is also one of the gravest problems that the tribes faced because they are uh, unfortunately or fortunately living in areas which are abundant in natural resources and since the uh, a developing economy needs to gain control over these natural resources. So, therefore, there is no alternative but to exploit those areas for the larger public good. But then what do tribals get in return and how how are they compensated for what they are losing? This remains a very valid question and this question was equally relevant uh, or in fact far more relevant during the colonial period because the Britishers had neither any intention uh, nor any emotional connect with the tribes and it, uh, their only agenda was exploitation of the natural resources whether it was uh, coal fields or whether it was uh, mines or whether it was timber. So, therefore, what happened was the large scale alienation of tribes uh, uh, from the uh, from their original uh, habitat from the lands uh, where they had been living in uh, for generations uh, and the passing of their land to uh, into the hands of the non-tribals uh, and uh, so and this process got further uh, speeded up with the introduction of roads and railways. So, from 1854 onwards with the introduction of railways and with the expansion of railway networks by 1860s, 70s, uh, uh, many new areas uh, came to be connected and therefore, uh, that issue of isolation was no longer there and it was uh, m many areas became accessible and even thickly forested areas now uh, you know were exposed to the exploitative tendencies of the colonial master. So, therefore, uh, when all uh, these tribal areas uh, were exposed and they were opened to public and once the thikadars that is the outsiders started coming and settling down in the tribal areas, there was an increasing reliance uh, on fraud, on deceit uh, uh, and also on coercion, uh, forcible eviction of the tribals from their areas and also one of the most important uh, development that took place was debt bondage. Because the tribals uh, were uh, simple people who were not really aware of the new uh, administrative uh, you know rules and regulations and the costly litigation uh, uh, practices were just not within their means. So, therefore, because they had no means to to take recourse to legal action, very often they would fall prey to uh, money lenders and they would not only lose their land but also their freedom and so they were uh, reduced to uh, you know a menial uh, workers who would not even get paid for the hard work that they were going to do for their masters. Now, despite such uh, pr uh, protective and restorative legislation that was uh, introduced uh, after 1947 uh, in order to uh, you know put a break to this exploitation. However, things did not really 
change and uh, in fact there has been a little change in the overall exploitative uh, existence uh, of the tribes uh, and uh, a lot needs to be done and therefore it is very relevant to go deeper into discussion of this topic so that uh, you as students uh, are able to devise ways and means you are able to think uh, on these terms as to how to help and how to forge uh, forge new networks and how to involve uh, you know uh, not to only the government but also citizens uh, in this endeavor to help the marginalized sections fight against injustice now uh, as we were discussing the problem of land alienation uh, the major source of land alienation uh, during the post independence period uh, has not been so much uh, as uh, what you call the encroachment of the non tribals uh, 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 encroachment by the non tribals over the tribal areas rather it has been the action of the state it has been the action of the private agencies and it has been ra uh, largely the loopholes that exist in the uh, already exi existing legislative framework that needs to be taken care of uh, and so therefore the the whole process of development to which indian state is geared and to which it is committed uh, that uh, the exploitation of tribals has uh, can be ascribed to. So, there exists a contradiction while on the one hand the state has to develop the country the, uh, the, re the resources have to be optimally utilized but on the other hand there also has to be a commitment towards uh, protection of uh, uh, marginalized groups who are living in these areas which are abundant in so many resources. Uh, the large scale Ex, uh, industrialization and exploitation of mineral resources uh, as well as the construction of irrigation dams, uh, power projects etc which various tribal areas have witnessed so far uh, uh, ha can be described as the most important factors that have uprooted most of the people. So therefore, this the, the sad story has continued till date that in the name of development the tribals are getting uprooted they are not only losing uh, their control over the natural resources uh, over which they had uh, control over so many centuries, but also they are not able to uh, you know enjoy the fruits of development and uh, uh, the benefits of development are not equally reaching to all the sections of Indian society. So therefore, at the end of the day, they have been the losers in this race for development. Now, uh, uh, having discussed uh, uh, the various factors that uh, have been responsible for, uh, you know, uh, uh, the underdeveloped uh, nature of existence of the tribals, I would now come to the next important uh, theme of today's discussion and that is tribal resistance movements during the colonial period. Here, uh, uh, one can classify the tribal resistance movements into uh, basically three types. Uh, since I would be first talking about pre-independence tribal resistance movements. So, these can be categorized into three types. The first category can be described as the reactionary movements. So, basically these were the those movements that were attempted that were started to oppose the political or the social reforms that had been enforced on the tribals and uh, this uh, a, a lot can be said uh, in this regard as far as the interference by the non-tribals in the tribal areas is concerned. So, here one can give reference to both the colonial masters, the colonial officials, uh, uh, you know the alien administrative machinery that was uh, superimposed on the tribal areas uh, post uh, uh, triumph of English East India Company and also uh, the influx of the outsiders or the thikadars uh, that is the Indian agents only uh, who migrated to these tribal areas in order to 
assist the colonial administration. Uh, so, such movements were mostly seen among the tribals who were living a very simple uh, life and uh, their entire existence was now threatened because of influx of the outsiders. Uh, then second type of uh, a movement that one can talk about uh, as far as the pre-independence movements are concerned uh, is the conservative kind of movement which opposed any kind of change in the tribal life. Uh, and as I had just, just discussed how culturally different and unique these tribes were and the new administrative machinery with the new uh, you know uh, religious mod, uh, modus operandi in the form of Christian missionaries and missionary schools uh, then uh, police stations dark chalkies etc uh, these new kind of foreign institutions that were introduced in the tribal areas were definitely not accepted very easily easily by the tribals and they always wanted to maintain the status quo. And the third type of movement uh, that one can talk about is the revolutionary movement uh, in which they tried to replace uh, uh, the certain traits of their traditional culture which probably under the influence of the western education or uh, under the influence of Christianity uh, etc. made them realize uh, the, the so called backwardness of uh, certain traditions that they were following and probably uh, uh, some of the uh, leaders who got educated and who became aware of the weaknesses that were prevalent among their people uh, and in order to help them come out of those weaknesses they tried to bring about some change in the mentality uh, by taking records to modern institutions. And uh, then uh, one can also talk about the revivalistic movements uh, because uh, some leaders they wanted to purify uh, uh, you know the, uh, certain elements of culture by eliminating evil influences by eliminating you know uh, uh, black magic or certain customs beliefs and traditions uh, and certain institutions that had had uh, created uh, a negative influence on the lives of these tribes. Now uh, carrying forward our classification uh, of the tribal movements in India a very important reference that must be made to any discussion on tribal situation in India is to the work of uh, uh, Professor K. S. Singh. Now, uh, Dr. K. S. Singh uh, in 1982, uh, uh, he uh, devised a very detailed, uh, you know, work on th the various tribes in India and especially uh, tribal movements in the Chota Nagpur region. And he has suggested a fourfold classification, uh, which is basically based on political autonomy uh, and uh, some examples can also be uh, given as far as these different kind uh, categories of uh tribal movements are concerned. So, for example, when one talks about political aut uh, autonomy, a very good example that one can give uh, of the tribal movement which wanted political autonomy was the Jharkhand movement uh, and then the agrarian movement. Uh, th for this, a very good example can be the Santhal uh, movement, then the forest based movements of the tribes, for example, the Koi movement, uh, then uh, some other examples of Sanskritization based tribal movements are the Tana Bhagat movement uh, and then the cultural movements which is uh, probably the fourth uh, category uh, that is the uh, a movement that was uh, started by tribals in support of their script, uh, in support of their uh, language etc. For example, Bheel movement. Uh, so, uh, a, a different kind of uh, categorization has been attempted by some other scholars also. This was the classification that was attempted by K. S. Singh. Now, next we would be discussing uh, some other kind of uh, classification which is probably based on, uh, you know, the function of the tribal movement, the, the particular uh, the cause that instigated a movement to take place. So, for example, uh, th this has been described as one category being the ethnic rebellion where particular ethnic groups wanted to uh, reorient themselves and wanted to you know uh, re-establish uh, their importance in the scheme of 
affairs. So, this was the ethnic rebellion. Then there was the reform movements which I have just uh, talked about as to how certain sections of tribal society wanted to bring about positive reform change within their uh, tribes in order to uh, tread the path of modernization and development. Then thirdly, political autonomy movements as was just uh, an example that was given was the Jharkhand. But this was well within the Indian Union. So, it was not as if the tribals started considering themselves of completely independent entities, but they wanted greater, uh, you know, uh, they wanted statehood and greater autonomy within the Indian Union. Then the secessionist movement, uh, examples of which can be given uh, for various uh, movements that took place in and are still active in the northeast and then of course the movements related to the agrarian unrest so basically these are the broad categories within which various tribal movements have been uh, divided into uh, now, another very important scholar, Dubé, uh, in, again in 1982, categorized tribal movements uh, into basically four categories, uh, these being the religious and the reform movements. Uh, then secondly, the movements for separate statehood, uh, again the insurgent movements, uh, just the example that I gave you for the northeastern states and then the cultural rights movements. For example, again, uh, one can talk about the Bhil movement. So, uh, now having discussed uh, these various movements uh, uh, and the kind of factors that, that were uh, instrumental in them, now the, uh, the next part of the lecture would deal with uh, some kind of case studies. Of course, it is not possible to deal with all the movements in greater detail, but I would be taking up some specific case studies for both pre-independence as well as post-independence, so as to have a deeper insight into the working of the tribal movements. Thank you. With this note, thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving us this uh, session. Friends, uh, you are uh, always welcome uh, with your feedbacks. Friends, uh, if you wish to know more about inequality and difference, this is the entire series. So, we are conducting another session after a short break and would be discussing more. You are requested to be with us. Thank you. <laughs> Hello friends, welcome back to the session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking in our series on inequality and difference and specifically we are discussing on tribal resistance movement. For the discussion of the topic, we have with us in our studios Dr. Shruti Vip. Dr. Shruti Vip is Assistant Professor in Department of History, PGDV Evening College, University of Delhi. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Vip once again and would request her to continue further. Hello ma'am, welcome to the lecture. Hello Vipika. Thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to carry on with this topic. Uh, 
so we were discussing tribal resistance movements and the different uh, types of uh, resistance movements and the way they have been categorized. So carrying our discussion further, uh, uh, I would now give you some examples of uh, different movements and the kind of category uh, in which you, they can fit in. So you would know how wide variety of movements exist uh, and Indian history is replete with uh, such variation of movements that though these movements were led by the tribals and more or less the, the reasons behind uh, these uprisings were also you know universal and almost similar but still there were uh, fine uh, differences between them and uh, you cannot really categorize all the movements into a single head. So for example, if you have to describe the movements of the Santhals and the Mundas, then uh, you can describe them as movements that were initiated against the exploitation by the outsiders that is uh, exploitation by the uh, colonial officials as well as the thikadars then if you have to describe the movements by the gonds uh, in madhya pradesh and by the mahars in andhra pradesh then these movements can be described as movements against economic deprivation uh, here the 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 reason uh, behind uh, their participation was grave economic deprivation that these tribes faced and near starvation situation that was there uh, for these tribes then the movements of the nagas and the mizos can largely be described as the movements with separatist tendencies then similarly the, the examples of nagas mizos jharkhand can also be described as seeking political autonomy uh, and for and state formation so again you know they are uh, movements with different objectives then the santhal movements can, la can largely be described as agrarian movements so again they are different from the earlier explained movements then the muria and the maria movements these were largely forest based movements uh, then uh, uh, one can also talk about uh, cultural and you know uh, socio cultural movements for example uh, the bhagat movement which uh, happened among bhils bhils of rajasthan and madhya pradesh these were the movements among the tribals of uh, then there were also movements among tribals tribals of south gujarat uh, and uh, murmu's movements among the uh, santhals these can also be described as the cultural movements where the insistence was on uh, um, getting uh, recognition for their uh, unique cultural traits their language dialects etc now coming to the issue of spectrum uh, of major tribal movements in India, it is very important to know both the qualitative as well as quantitative description of these tribal movements. And in fact, it was in 1976 that the Anthropological Survey of India had identified almost 36 uh, uh, kind of tribal movements in the country. Now, the, uh, there have been various scholars like Mathur, books, uh, then uh, Sharma, K.S. Singh, etc., who have done detailed uh, discussion and in-depth in study about the tribal movements and situation in India. And they have uh, argued that the tribal movements in India can be traced even to the period before 1768. So it was not as if it was from 1770s only that tribals started revolting against the authority. In fact, it was even much earlier. Uh, then uh, K.S. Singh has divided all these movements into uh, three broad phases which I have already discussed with you. And uh, uh, now I would be chronologically telling you, uh, you know, uh, the details as to which phase continued from which period to which period. So the first phase uh, the, as has been described by K.S. Singh uh, was from 1778 to uh, uh, 1860. This can be described as the first phase and now this phase is very important because this period coincides with the rise expansion and consolidation of the 
colonial rule in India. So, therefore, uh, a large area uh, had come under the control of the Britishers and uh, most of these areas uh, uh, which were under uh, forests and which were uh, under thick habitation were probably uh, inhabited by the tribal. So, therefore, uh, it, this conflict between the colonial state and the tribals was bound to happen. Now, the second phase uh, which uh, can be described as the phase from 1860 onwards uh, covers the period of colonialism when the merchant capital uh, started penetrating into the tribal area. So, uh, in the in the uh, preceding uh, years, the merchant capital had only uh, focused on the plains areas on in the on the non uh, tribal areas. But with the development of state machinery, with the development of uh, means of transportation and communication, especially after 1860s, uh, and uh, railways helped in a big way in this telegraphs, roads, etc. So, then there was no looking back for the uh, colonial state and it was then that the merchant capital started penetrating the, uh, the tribal areas also and now this brought about a greater role reversal for the tribals because now their relationship with, uh, with the land and forests uh, was now increasingly being questioned by the state uh, and not only being questioned in fact uh, you know uh, they were being dictated, forest uh, legislation was coming about and uh, they were being banned from even entering the forest areas and gathering the fuel wood or some other uh, forest products on which their subsistence was based. So, therefore, the clash between the colonial regime and the tribals was bound to happen. Now, the third phase uh, roughly deals with the period from 1920 to 1947 uh, and during this phase, the tribals not only began to launch the so-called separatist movement in a number of areas, but at the same time, they also participated in a number of agrarian and nationalist struggles. So, uh, here I would like to say that whenever we are talking about, uh, whenever we are discussing uh, independence movement, we also, we always focus on uh, the role that was played by Indian National Congress or the role that was played by the movements that were led by Mahatma Gandhi. But it is equally important uh, to talk about how the marginalized sections of Indian society, uh, especially the tribals who were living in remote areas, they also were, you know, uh, uh, indulging in almost a parallel movement which was attacking the colonial regime and which was trying to win over greater confidence and freedom for themselves and therefore, uh, uh, we should not neglect their contribution and their efforts also must be equally documented and given importance in the annals of history. Now, uh, then the next phase that one can talk about is the post-1947 period till date. It is not as if now the tribal movements have come to an end. There are still struggles going on in a number of nooks and corners of the country where tribals are still uh, marginalized and now they have to not only face the onslaught of the outsiders but also the, du the dual burden of privatization, neoliberalization and globalization is not only robbing them of their resources but also creating greater conflict in the area. So, uh, having discussed now these uh, different uh, chronological phases, uh, there have however been attempts to identify several tribal movements basically as peasant uprisings also. So, there has been a tendency to overlook or you know to neglect the specific tribal elements that are prevalent in their uh, struggle and uh, it is though it is true that most of the tribals lead their lives as uh, you know uh, fo food gatherers forest dwellers and simple peasants but there is a need to categorize their struggle into a separate category. Now, many other scholars have also treated tribal movements as uh, peasant movements like uh, Kathleen Gog, then uh, Desai as well as uh, Guha. Uh, 
Uh, now, uh, historically speaking, since the introduction of the permanent settlement by Lord Cornwallis, uh, increasing in instances, increasing incidents of land alienation started taking place uh, and from 1790s onwards, there was large scale uh, in, uh, instance of land alienation happening from tribals to the non-tribals and according to uh, David Hardiman, this not only resulted in greater discontentment among the tribals, but it also was a, a motivating force for them to mobilize themselves against the authorities. Uh, it has also been argued that the tribals revolted mostly against those alien groups who wanted to acquire their culture, you know, their habitat, their land, their forests, their resources. Uh, uh, for example, the Mundas. Mundas uh, initially, who uh, they were, uh, uh, they had their own independent struggle that was going on, and B Birsa Munda was the most important leader of this movement. But soon this struggle got culminated into the Sardar movement, which was basically a peasant movement, uh, uh, which was based on agricultural uh, issues and uh, their program was also uh, more or less towards reforms in uh, agriculture and reforms in the lives of the uh, tribals living in the Chota Nagpur region. Similarly, the Gonds of Andhra Pradesh protested when they lost their traditional privileges in the forest. So, uh, uh, a struggle that had started as a peasant struggle soon got culminated into a tribal struggle and this happened in a number of places at a number of times. Then another very important scholar who has done detailed research on the tribes of India is Verrier Elvin. Uh, who pointed out that how the tribals firmly believe that the forests belong to them. Uh, it is in fact the tribes and the forests are, cannot be separated and they, it is they who has uh, the right to collect the produce from the forest. They also no, uh, worship the forest as their god and this has been going on for centuries. Uh, in fact, it is their very life, their very subsistence, their very culture uh, and therefore, uh, they were very upfront about resisting any attempt to take away forest from their lives. So, therefore, uh, land alienation and losing their control over forests were some very important factors that were instrumental uh, behind most of the tribal resistance movements. And most of the tribal movements during the colonial period were organized against the oppressors. Uh, they could be zamidars, they could be money lenders, thikadars, uh, as well as the colonial officials and then also uh, uh, various institutions that were associated with the colonial rule, for example, dark chokis, police chokis, uh, thanas uh, and then uh, also uh, church uh, buildings, etc., schools, etc. Now, uh, coming to uh, the discussion on uh, you know, the nomenclature or the chronological description of a number of tribal uh, movements from 1768 to uh, till date. Here one can talk about the earliest tribal uprising being the Chuar uprising, C-H-U-A-R, uh, Chuar uprising. This was basically uh, uh, against the ruler of Dhalbhum. Then the Halba rebellion, which happened in 1774, uh, then uh, uh, this was primarily against the outsiders who had started settling down. Then one can also talk about the Chor rebellion in Bengal, uh, which took place from 1795 to 1800, which again uh, was uh, uh, against uh, the new kind of administrative setup that had been started in the area. Then one can talk about the coal rebellion 1795, then uh, 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 the important leaders of uh, these tribal revolts were Budhu Bhagat, Joa Bhagat, uh, Sui Munda etc. 
Now, all these names that have been now uh, accounted for, uh, the, they are very important because while we all know the names of important political leaders, uh, hardly uh, a few amongst us would be knowing about the important tribal leaders of these movements. Then, uh, uh, Mizoram was also home to a number of tribal movements and uprisings and it is not as if in recent past only uh, that the northeastern states uh, have undergone uh, the, uh, so much of resistance. In fact, it was from 1810 onwards that uh, in uh, the, the Mizo tribes started resisting and uh, then uh, in Odisha there were important rebellions in 1817. Uh, then one can talk about the Bhil rebellion uh, that took place between 1822 to 1857, a fairly long period and uh, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh became very important areas where these uh, rebellions took place and the important leaders being uh, Bhagoji Naik and Kajar Singh. Uh, then one can also give examples of Khasi and Garo rebellion uh, 1829, then in Meghalaya. Then one can talk about uh, Bastar Rebellion, uh, 1842 to 1863. Then the Jharkhand movement again, uh, which was not as if uh, a movement that started shaping up from 18 uh, from 1960s and 70s. Rather, there was a much uh, longer history to it. And in fact, from 1845 onwards, this Jharkhand movement started uh, picking up and. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, during uh, the first uh, 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 independence move, uh, struggle, that is, uh, which is generally described as the revolt of 1857, during this period also, tribals were quite active and they were, uh, you know, uh, uh, indulging in their own kind of uh, disrespect and towards the colonial rule. And here one can give example of Sidi, Sidhu Murmu and Kanu Murmu, uh, who kind of initiated uh, a freedom struggle. Then one can give examples of Koi Revolt 1859, Bastar uh, Revolt, then uh, Cookie Invasion in 1860s and uh, then uh, carrying forward uh, the, the tradition. Uh, in Even in uh, South India, there have been instances of a number of tribal uh, revolts. For example, uh, in Visagha Patnam 1879, which is known as the first Rampa Rebellion. Uh, then, uh, even in Andaman and Nicobar, uh, there were series of tribal rebellions from 1883 onwards, where the Sentinelese tribal people participated in this resistance. Uh, so, therefore, uh, from 1885 to 1886, uh, some other important rebellions that took place was the Santal revolt under the leadership of Sidhu and Kanhu uh, and uh, they were active in and around the region of Dhanbad. Then uh, the Muria Gond rebellion uh, in the region around eastern UP. Uh, then uh, uh, the Tana Bhagat movement 1820 uh, sorry uh, 1920 to 1921 uh, then the Jharkhand Tana Bhagat uh, movement then the second Rampa rebellion uh, in South India from 1921 to 1923 and the Koya rebellion uh, in which Aluri Sita uh, Aluri Rama Raju played a very important role in 1922. And now, these were some very important tribal rebellions, which does not mean that these were the only, there were many more. But since it won't be possible for me to give a detailed description or even a passing reference to uh, most of the rebellions, I would request the students to do some research on their own and to find out, you know, uh, important names of not only the rebellions, but also the leaders and that would be our true ode to them. So, uh, now uh, having discussed these various uh, rebellions and movements in passing, uh, with passing reference, I would now take up a detailed discussion and some of the case studies of some important tribal movements which would also help you uh, to understand how different movements need to be categorized differently because their goals and their causative factors were also different.
so, one such movement that I would be talking about is the Jharkhand movement in Bihar. This was basically a movement of tribal communities consisting of settled agriculturists who were uh, got converted to or who were influenced by Vaishnavism. And there were some uh, important cultural changes that took place in the lives of these tribals, especially after 1830s onwards, when uh, a number of, uh, you know, uh, modern institutions were introduced in this area. There was influx of Christianity, uh, modern hospitals, uh, schools, Christian missionaries started arriving in Jharkhand from 1845 onwards. And th all this brought about greater change and sensitization in this region and in fact many tribes got converted to Christianity and many schools uh, uh, you know ev including even the higher uh, educational institutions for both the sexes were established in this area by the colonial administration. Now, wh why all this was being done was not to modernize the area or to, you know, bring about a positive change in the lives of the areas, but in order to make this area more conducive to the colonial administration. So, uh, now this uh, definitely had uh, uh, an alternative uh, impact and that was that some of the tribal leaders uh, who got educated, uh, they started identifying ways and means to bring about a positive change in the lives of their community folks. And the, with the impact of modern education uh, on the changing aspirations of both the boys and the girls, uh, the change was bound to happen in various other fields as well. So, the region which was already a rich source of natural resources like coal, timber, bauxite, uh, asbestos, limestone, graphite, etc. Uh, uh, resulted in l f a much greater exploitation of this area by the uh, both the colonial as well as the post-colonial uh, state. And coal mining in this region started much earlier uh, than 1947. In fact, it started in 1856 itself. And uh, uh, in fact, by the year 1907, Tata Iron and Steel Factory was established in Jamshedpur. And this entire belt was uh, surrounded by the uh, tribal habitations. So, therefore, you can well imagine that how early these tribal areas had been exposed to uh, the socio-economic cultural change which this area was going to witness in the uh, succeeding periods. Now, uh, since independence, much emphasis uh, was laid on planned in industrialization, a, a planned economy and uh, you know a development of heavy industries, development of heavy iron and steel industries, especially uh, uh, there was a lot of insistence on mining because it was imperative that the economy became self uh, dependent as soon as possible after 1947 and it was not uh, considered as one of the prime duties of the government to uh, make the country tread the path of industrialization, progress and self-dependence. So, therefore, the Jharkhand region uh, became instrumental in this endeavor towards industrialization uh, because 75 percent of the revenue of Bihar was contributed by the Jharkhand region because of the richness of the resources. Uh, the government began acquiring the lands of the tribals uh, in order to gain access to the natural resources, but did not adequately compensate them. So, the tragic story began from there and the tribal rehabilitation became a major uh, stumbling block and uh, uh, the tribals were neither compensated enough for the lands that were taken away from them and nor they were adequately paid for the forest products that were being supplied by them. So, therefore, by the beginning of 20th century, the Jharkhand movement 
uh, was uh, mobilized uh, 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 by the Christian tribal students who had gained access to uh, you know a modern education and they had realized the importance of mobilizing themselves and uh, considering themselves as uh, the deprived sections of the society who had to fight for their rights and it was later on continued by the uh, uh, by the, the non-Christians as well as some other non-tribal groups also. So, the movement became uh, uh, quite uh, vocal and the leaders they became quite vocal from 1920s onwards and they started identifying uh, ways and means to stop their exploitation. Now, uh, uh, another very interesting uh, feature of the Jharkhand tribal movement was the shift from ethnicity to regionalism. So, while uh, the movement started uh, uh, with the sole purpose of uh, you know gaining greater respect and identification, identity formation, uh, ethnic uh, you know uh, uh, identity formation, but soon the goal was no longer that. Soon the goal got transformed into a much wider perspective, a much bigger vision and that was a regional identification, regional region formation, state formation and the Jharkhand movement developed in phases from ethnicity to regionalism from 1950 onwards. So, of course, it was not possible to talk in terms of state formation or regional, regionalism before independence. So, once independence came about and once these areas did not receive the kind of attention that they were expecting from the uh, independent state, they started mobilizing themselves in terms of a regional power. The social base of this movement later got broadened to include the non-tribals also, so as to transform it from an ethnic to a regional movement as has been pointed out by Ghosh in 2001. So, therefore, uh, this uh, interesting transformation from uh, 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 a movement of only tribals to begin with and how the non-tribals also got accommodated in this movement and in fact they became very important partners in this movement uh, can be seen from this Jharkhand movement. The movement was based largely on the demand of autonomous state owing to the exploitation of local tribal people by the Dikus or the outsiders. So, therefore, uh, while the tribals were being exploited by the non-tribals, but there were there was a specific category of non-tribals that they were against. They were not against all the non-tribals and therefore, they were ready to align with the non with, with, the, with those non-tribals who uh, who were uh, probably belonging to the similar socio cultural economic fabric and they were not their exploitators. So, therefore, uh, it was the result of an interplay between historical, cultural, political, economic forces which culminated in the emergence of the Jharkhand party in the Chota Nagpur division and the Santhal Paragnas of Bihar by the late 1940s. Now, this was a very important political development which played a, a great instrumental role in mobilizing not only political forces but also socially and culturally uh, empowering the whole movement. Uh, now, having discussed uh, uh, so far, I shall now take a break and continue with the topic in near future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so very much for giving us this uh, session. Friends, uh, you have gained a lot of information today. We believe that. And uh, if you have any query or feedback for this particular lecture, then do write to us at info.cc at nic.in. The lecture is going to be uploaded on YouTube soon. So keep watching us, keep writing us. We are taking your leave with the promise that we are going to meet again. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Gritisha.